A2 Calf, Judd Winnick. How are you guys? Good. Good. Okay, so I'll just leap in. Um, so I'm, I'm Judd Winnick, that's me. And I'm a cartoonist, as most of you already know. That's my job. It's the best job in the whole wide world. Yep. Um, and currently I'm doing this Hilo series. Um, it's, it's maybe my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, and I'll explain why as we do this stuff. And uh, the most recent one came out in January, um, Waking the Monsters, and we're very, very excited about that. So what I want to do today is uh, um, I want to tell a story, and when I'm done with the story, then I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. If you don't have any questions, then maybe I'll have time to tell another story. My one request is that while I'm telling my story, I'm not going to answer questions. So if you raise your hand to ask a question during my story, I am not going to call on you because I'm still telling my story. <laughs> Got it? Good. Okay. So this story is going to be about um, doing things twice and high-low and stuff. So it's a story about doing things twice and high-low and stuff. And this is actually a story about doing the second high-low book. So, um, this is about, I guess, three years and change ago. Um, I had finished the first Hilo book, and I was about to begin working on the second Hilo book. And when I say I was going to begin working on it, I don't mean that I was literally, well, when I do a book, I don't like sit down like, okay, ready? Book two. Let's go. It's, I have the, we'll call it the luxury, of when I'm working on the first book, I am thinking about the second book. So, um, and when I say thinking about it, I don't mean like just staring into space thinking about the next Hilo book. I mean when I'm out and about living my life, I am thinking about what's going to be going on in the next story. So when I am driving in my car, I'm thinking about the next Hilo book. When I am exercising, I'm thinking about the next Hilo book. When I am in the supermarket, I'm thinking about the next Hilo book. And yeah, even sometimes I will actually stare into space and think about the next Hilo book. This is my process. It's not like by the time I start writing, I usually have a pretty good idea where we're going to go. And where we're going to go with the next book, I knew it was going to be back in Hilo's town. Um, I knew I wanted it. The kids are going to be back. DJ and Gina, who are the other two kids in the book, they're going to be back. I knew I wanted it to be set during winter because I live in Northern California where we do not have snow. And I thought it would be fun to do that. And I thought Hilo would look really cute in a scarf, which he does. Um, I knew we were going to have these portals opening up from different worlds and animals and monsters and creatures are going to be falling out of the portals and running around the town and the kids were going to be opening the portals and sending the monsters back. I knew that was the story. I also knew that I was going to introduce a new character and I knew this new character was going to be a kiddo and I knew this kiddo was going to be from another world and I knew the kiddo was going to be a girl and I knew I wanted her to be magical like a sorceress or a witch. And I thought maybe that DJ would have a crush on her, and that she would have a crush on DJ, and Gina wouldn't like it because they were gonna have a crush on each other, and she'd get a little bit jealous, and maybe the whole story would end with them going to a school dance. So, that was what I was thinking about. I had a year to think about it, and I'm thinking about portals, I'm thinking about snow, I'm thinking about winter, I'm thinking about school dances and crushes. I got it, I got it, I got it. I thought about it for a year. And then I was about ready to really sit down and actually start writing the book. Thinking is done, working is going to begin. Now, what was interesting is when I was about to start writing the second book, my family and I went to New Zealand. How many of y'all know, know New Zealand? It's like Zealand, but new. <laughs> Grown ups like that joke, kids never like it, never. Um, so I think most of us know New Zealand from, from the Lord of the Rings series. How many of you little guys know the Lord of the Rings movies? A little bit. So it's a little bit, a little bit older for you. It's a little bit intense. But the interesting thing is they shot all of the Lord of the Rings movies and The Hobbit in New Zealand. So when you go to New Zealand, you actually can see hobbits and orcs and real live dragons. They have them. I'm kidding. None of that's true. But what is interesting is that when my family and I went to New Zealand, it was summer in California, and New Zealand's actually on the other side of the planet. So it was winter. In New Zealand, whoops, it was winter in New Zealand when we went. I'm skipping ahead. I'm skipping way ahead. Where's winter? There it is. Okay, so it was winter in New Zealand, which was a lot of fun for my children because they had never seen snow before. And then we went and, like, there's snow. So the way our day would work is um, my wife would take 
uh, our children out, this is my wife Pam, and our kids, she would take them out and they would go exploring in New Zealand in the winter, looking for dragons and orcs and hobbits and stuff in New Zealand. And I was back at the house, and I would spend my mornings writing. So I was writing the second Hilo book. And one morning, one of the first mornings, my daughter shows up before she leaves and says, hey dad, and I said, oh, hey kiddo. Hey daddy, I've been thinking about the next Hilo book that you're writing, and you should really put a cat in the book. Oh yeah. A what? A cat. A cat? Yep, in the next Hilo book. You should totally put a cat in the next Hilo book. It'd be so much better. <laughs> well, we talked about the next book, and I'm not really sure how a cat enters into the story. Because, you know, it's about all these monsters and creatures that fall out of portals and stuff. So I don't know if a cat really fits in there. Okay. So you get it. There's not going to be a cat in the book. No cat in the next Hilo book. You get it? No. Uh-huh. Daddy should really put a cat in the next aisle. Of <laughs> so that's how it would go. Uh, my wife would take the kids out every morning. They go exploring, looking for dragons and orcs and stuff. I would meet up with them in the afternoon to go exploring with them. But the mornings were for me to work on the second aisle book. And every morning before they went out, hey dad, oh hey kiddo, you put a cat in the aisle book yet? <laughs> no, I haven't put a cat in the aisle book. You really should put a cat in the next aisle book, daddy. Because if you do, it'll be much better. It's like, well, I'll think about it. Think about it a lot. It would be, be really funny and better if you put a cat in the next Hilo book. So I'm thinking i got to put a cat in the Hilo book. So I decided, okay, I'll put a cat in the book. She'll be happy. We'll get it over with. There'll be a cat in the book. It'll be in the background. Daddy, put a cat in the book? Yeah, look, there's a cat in the book. They're in the background. Done. Cat's in the book. Done. And so sure enough, hey, Dad. Oh, hey, kiddo. Daddy, if I think about the cat that you're going to put in the Hilo book, and the cat that you should put in the Hilo book should definitely not just be a cat in the background. <laughs> it should be a cat that's an important part of the story. Like an important cat. Like, okay, so I'm really thinking I'm going to put a cat in the book at this point. The thing was, I was having bigger trouble than putting a cat in the book at this point. Because as I was starting writing the story, I, well, I told you guys that I was going to put this sorceress girl in the book. And, uh, you know, she, DJ's now crushing her, she's now crushing DJ, and she doesn't get jealous. Well, as I was writing this story, it was not working out. It was not working <laughs> for me. I didn't like the story. I didn't like the whole thing about having a crush. It just felt like kind of cliche. It just, it wasn't funny, it wasn't fun, it wasn't working. And I was really stuck, because I'd been thinking about this character for about a year. I've been thinking about the story for about a year, and here I am writing it, and this is an important part of the story, and it is not working. Hey, Dad. Hey, kiddo. You put a cat in the Hilo book yet? <laughs> no, I haven't put a cat in the Hilo book. We really should, Daddy. I think the book would be so much better if you put a cat in the next Hilo book. Okay, well, I'll think about it. Okay, great. Thanks. So there I am, working on the second book. Uh, she's bugging me about this cat. I'm trying to get the Sorceress Girl story to somehow work and somehow be better, and it's just not coming together. And then, I get an idea. Oh, I get a great idea, a really great idea. Just came to me, just like that. What if, what if, okay, okay, what if the Sorceress Girl, what if the Sorceress Girl was actually a cat? <laughs> now, not a, not a cat cat, but an, but an anthropomorphic cat. You guys know what anthropomorphic means? Uh, no. Anthropomorphic. So anthropomorphic. <laughs> Anthropomorphic is when animals act like people. Um, they walk on their hind legs, they talk, they wear clothes. So, Mickey Mouse, anthropomorphic mouse. Bugs Bunny, anthropomorphic rabbit. All the guys in Zootopia, anthropomorphic animals. And that's what I wanted to do. I thought it'd be cool if the Sorceress Girl was actually an anthropomorphic cat. But <laughs> not like that, because that looks weird. So it was played with a little bit, a little bit smaller, a little bit cuter. Oh, I think that's it. Yes, I like that. I gave her a big old wand. Yep, that's the cat. That's the cat. I got it. I got the cat. I'm so happy. Just like that. Just like that. I was really, really excited about the cat. And so when somebody showed up and said, hey, Dad, but hey, kiddo, I put a cat in the Hilo book. You really put a cat in the Hilo book? I did. It's in the book. Cat in the book. Awesome. And it was awesome. I was very, very excited. There's a cat in the book. But now I had a new problem because, well, I'd spent a year thinking about, you know, you know not this cat but this story around this sorceress girl who uh, DJ's got a crush on her, she's got a crush on DJ, but now she's a cat. <laughs> and that's kind of weird, right? <laughs> 
So I had to rethink everything I was going to do with her, which was hard because I, I know my other characters. I don't have a whole other book figuring out who they are. Like, I know who Hilo is. Hilo is his positive protagonist. The thing I like the best about him is that he's excited about everything new. If it's new, even if it's, it's going to kill them, he's really excited about it. If DJ and Gina and Hilo are running away from some giant robot, Hilo might be lagging behind, like, Hilo, come on, it's going to kill us. Like, I know, I know, I know. But you got to appreciate how awesome this thing is. <laughs> That's him. And I totally had him figured out. You know, and then there was DJ. DJ was a lot like me as a kid. Uh, I was very, very self-conscious as a kid. I was constantly worried about what other people thought about me. And DJ was very much like that. Unlike me, DJ's incredibly brave. When his friends are in trouble, he's the first one to just jump into action. That's DJ. And Gina, Gina got totally figured out. Gina, um, Gina's the smartest of the bunch. She uh, loves books, she loves science, she loves comic books, she loves science fiction, she loves sports. That's Gina, I know who she is. But this cat, I didn't know. So I did what I always do. If I'm stuck, I just go forward. And I wasn't up to the part of the book where the cat jumped in. So I was going to keep writing. And I was hoping by the time I got to the cat portion of the book, an idea would occur to me. And sure enough, boom, an idea occurred to me. <laughs> just as I got there. Just as I got there, just as I got to the scene where the cat showed up, I totally figured out who the cat was. So the scene was, and some of you are even holding it up. That's what got very cute. So the scene that I was writing was uh, when she first shows up. So we're in a snowy field, and a giant portal opens up, and something big and giant falls out of the portal. It's giant monster hippos. So giant monster hippos are falling out of the portal and running across the snowy field. Ah! And then a portal opens up behind them. Something falls out. Who falls out? The cat. <laughs> so the cat falls out and starts chasing them. So there I am in New Zealand, putting pen to paper, and, I'm th and, and when I wrote the first words that came out of her mouth, I totally had her figured out, just in this one scene. So there she is, chasing the giant hippos. She opens her big old mouth and yells to the hippos, Ah, come back and fight your blood and zinc cake boils from a troll's butt! <laughs> and with that, I totally had her figured out. I knew who this character was, what she was like, who she was. And she was, well... She is uh, just a little spitfire. She is the first one to jump into a fight. She is brave. She is magical. She is loud. She is fierce. And she is Scottish. I don't know why she's Scottish. But when I heard her voice in my head, she sounded Scottish. So she's Scottish. And she's just as cute as a bug's butt. So... Someone showed up at my door and said, hey, Dad, like, hey, kiddo, come here, come here, come here. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Look at this. So I got this cat. This cat was an anthropomorphic cat, and uh, she is small, she is fierce, and she is Scottish. What do you think? I think that's awesome. <laughs> and she was. We were really excited about it. Um, and honestly, a day or two after I figured this out, um, we were, my whole family, my wife Pam and our, our two kids, were, sta were standing up in the kitchen of this house we'd rented in New Zealand, and we're coming up with her name. And we came up with her name by going through the entire alphabet, beginning with all the A names we think of. Like, is she an Alice? No. Agatha? No. Arithmetic? No. Bees? Basior? No. Bartholomew? No. And so we finally got down to the P's, and the name we landed on that we liked was Polly. She felt like a Polly. And her full name is Palandra Packwallis Rimdale Karimako. <laughs> big name. I wanted to give her a big regal name because she's, you know, like a little cat. But also, her last name is, uh, is Karimako. And Karimakos are actually birds in New Zealand. That's Karimako. And um, they're, they're everywhere. And they actually have a very particular song. You can hear them or... Or rather, my daughter was the first one who could always hear them. When we were out, like, oh, there's a Karimako. And we'd look up, and sure enough, there they were. So since Polly was born in New Zealand, I thought I'd give her something from New Zealand. So she's Polly Karimako. There she is. So there are four Hilo books out, and there's three of them. And um, a thing I learned when doing this second book, um, well, the second book going into it, it was going to be about this sorceress girl, and then somewhere along the way, this sorceress girl became a Scottish cat. <laughs> and that happened because, because I, uh, I do things more than once. You little guys here, how many of your teachers talk about doing a first draft and a second draft? Okay. 
All you little guys, keep your hands up if you really like doing a second draft. If your hand is still up, I think you're lying. <laughs> I do. Because i got to be honest with you. I don't like doing a second draft. I wish the first time I did something, it just knocked it out of the park. Perfect. Ready to go. When I was a kid, I hated doing sketches before doing a real drawing. I'm just going to do one drawing. It's going to be done. But so often in life, you are just going to get the opportunity just to do something once and not get a second try. When you get to do something again, when you get a chance to make something better, you should do it. Uh, my kids taught me an expression when they were at school, when I was giving, when I was giving this talk, and my own children said, yeah, your sloppy copy. Your first draft should be called your sloppy copy. And it just means it should be a mess. You should put all kinds of stuff into it, things that aren't going to work. But when you get to do things again, and maybe a third time, they always get better. I promise you. But maybe a lot of grown-ups are not going to tell you this. Doing the second draft stinks. It's no fun. It's work. But it always gets better. When you practice at something, you'll get better, honestly. And for me, it was truly about struggling along, figuring it out, and at some point, you know, she became a Scottish cat. <laughs> so this is the cover of the third book, uh, High Low, Great Big Book. And on the cover, you've got who? You've got Gina, DJ, Hilo, and who else? Holly. 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 The Sorcerer's Scroll that as I originally wrote it was never supposed to get out of the second book. We were going to see her this one time, and then we were never, ever going to see her again. But when she became Polly, something else happened. For one, I just, I just loved writing her. I just loved having the character in the book. I thought she was great. But she gave me all these other ideas, that Polly actually became a really important part of the story. Now, she's not in the fourth book, but I'll do a spoiler. She's in the fifth book. She's in the sixth book. And who she is and where she's from feeds into the story in such an important way. She, she became a necessary part of the story. And that was only because I didn't just leave it at the sloppy copy. Again, when you have the chance to do something more than once, when you have a chance to make it better, it always will be. So do that second draft, do that third draft, and honestly, your sorceress girl will turn into a Scottish cat and it'll be better, <laughs> I promise. So that's my story about doing things twice. Um, Now, what we can do is I could tell another story, or we can answer some questions, or even both. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, oh, oh. Yes. How many books are there? How many books are there? Um, how many high-level books are there? There will be, there'll be many, many high-level books. Um, the, uh, there are going to be six books in this first, there are comic geeks in the room, so the first story arc. Um, so this first, uh, story arc seems to be turning into Hilo's origin story. So for those who might not have read it, and some who have, Hilo is basically battling out with this big bad guy called Razor Work. So this first, these first six books is basically the story of Hilo and Razor Work. These will wrap up in book six. We'll be done with the story of Hilo and Razor Work in book six. And then with book seven, we're going to start an entirely new Hilo story. Um, and those will be probably... Uh, Three books for that one, and maybe some more. I'm still working it out, but um, there'll be many, many Hilo books. Is there I'm, four currently, or five? Currently? There are four currently out, and the fifth one comes out next year. There'll be a book a year okay. for the rest of my life, probably. <laughs> I mean, you see what I'm in for. yeah, you know. Um, truth is, uh, I'm a cartoonist, and it's the best job in the whole wide world. And uh, when I was 10 years old, I used to draw pictures while I half watched TV. I'm 48, and now I draw pictures while I half watch TV. <laughs> so it's a great job to have. And uh, I, I, I go to school sometimes. I go to school often, but sometimes kids will ask me, like, so are you ever going to retire? I don't know why children ask this, but they do. Um, and I'm like, no. It's like, I make things up and I draw them. Retire to do what? Like, you know, it's like my job is, like, closer to a hobby than most people's jobs. Um, and honestly, I, I don't actually have hobbies unless, like, reading comic books and watching movies is a hobby. Um, I do this. I love doing this. Um, so six books for this first arc, first four are out, and many more to come. Any other questions? I'm going to put my glasses on because I can't see any of you. Um, yes, you're right here. How did you get into writing comics? How did I get into writing comics? Oh, how do you even begin to answer that one? I'll say this, that I've been... Um, can you hear me better if I do that? Is that easier now? I'll, I'll talk a little lower now. Um, I... Uh, I've always wanted to be a cartoonist. Um, 
And my mom and dad never, ever told me that that's a dumb job and you shouldn't do that or you should get something to fall back on. I was very, very lucky in that way. Um, even so much as like, when I was about 15, I was doing my own comic strip just for me. And my dad being my dad, which is awesome, my dad uh, took this comic strip to my local paper, which is Long Islander, and he said, hey, my son's doing this comic strip. I think it's great and you guys should publish it. And oddly enough, the editor of the Long Islander said, you know what, I think we will. So the weekly paper, the Long Islander, started publishing my comic strip once a week. I was paid $10 a week, and I was so excited. So it started with that. Um, but I've done, I've done all kinds of different stuff. Um, I've written superhero comics for about 10 years. Um, I've done my own independent comics. I did an animated series for a while. All kinds of different stuff. But I will say that um, I kind of think Hilo kind of brings together everything that I've always wanted to do and what I love. Like, I'm, I was a comic strip cartoonist for a while, and Hilo kind of looks like a comic strip um, and has lots of jokes, but I, I, always, I also like action adventures. I like action adventures that are for everybody, um, even though I spent, you know, over a decade making dark and grim superhero stories, which I did. Um, so, but this is more fun for me. Yes. Yes, you. Can I put myself into the story? Yeah. I like to think I put myself into every story I make. Um, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a character in the book, but I'm in there in a lot of different ways. Um, like I said, like DJ, um, DJ's a lot like me, and if there's a character in there that's mostly based on me, it would be DJ, except um, DJ's Asian American, 10 years old, and he's got awesome spiky hair, which is not me. Um, <laughs> But a lot of the qualities about DJ um, are very much like me. Um, as a kid, I was super self-conscious about what people thought about me. That's how DJ starts. And uh, I like that over the course of the story, he learns that that's not so important. Um, and for him, he figures out that mm, what he likes to be best is somebody's friend. And that's what he's really good at. He's really good at. And other things, that, like Gina is based on my wife. Hilo is based on the idea of a best friend that I always wanted. Um, I would have loved to have a best friend who would have told me, like, don't worry about it. Let's just go do this crazy thing. Come on. We might die, but it's going to be great. Come on, come on, come on. Just, and, you know, fell out of the sky and has, like, superpowers. Um, I would have loved to have that. Uh, yes, you right there. I'll get you next. Yes, you. You had a question. You rose your hand, so I was calling on you. Will you ever do it, like, 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 so, like, like, they know that they're in a comic? Like, like. Will they, are you, are you asking me, will the characters ever break a fourth wall and acknowledge that they're actually cartoon characters? Yes. Look how meta you went. <laughs> I can tell you honestly, no, they will not. Um, I'm not going to break the fourth wall. It's so funny, you, honestly, because my own children, we were having this discussion um, just a little while ago. I forget what movie we were watching where someone was breaking the fourth wall a lot. And they're saying, they, they've never actually seen that. Oh, Bring the Fourth Wall, for those playing at home. Um, Bring the Fourth Wall is when you're, it's, it's a movie or a book where characters freely acknowledge the fact that they're in like a movie or a book. Like, it's like, like we gotta hurry up because I think this movie that we're in is gonna end badly. You know, that they acknowledge that. Um, and that's sort of kind of fun. Um, we're not gonna do that here. Because um, it's a straight up action adventure. And I'll tell my jokes in their goofy ways. But it's a lot of fun when people do it and they, 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 they can sort of, they, they did it in this, in this story I was telling up here about how to do things twice. You saw them like, kind of look at us sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I do like that. Uh, yes, you had a question. So what advice would you give to young comic artists who want a future career in comic arts? What advice would I give to young cartoonists? Um, uh, two pieces of advice. One I've already given that you, know, you need to do more than one draft. But the biggest advice, not just for cartoonists. Well, OK, quick cartoonist one. It's you might hear from people when it comes to doing drawings and stuff that you shouldn't copy stuff. You should do your own material. Don't. It's okay to copy stuff. Um, I learned how to draw by copying out of comic books, and I learned how to draw by copying Garfield. The yeah. first comic strip I fell in love with was Garfield, yeah. and I would draw Garfield over and over and over again. First is copying, and then I could do it by memory, then I could do my own you know, Garfield stuff. And then I decided to do my own comic strip about a fat cat who was very obnoxious and mean, who was not Garfield, <laughs> but my own. Um, but you learn through imitation. So I think copying stuff, you kind of you learn how they do it. You kind of learn the bits and pieces of how things come together. So it's okay to copy other people's artwork. And secondly, uh, for storytellers as well as cartoonists, if you're going to do a book or a comic or whatnot, 
try really, really, well, everyone gets this big idea. You always get excited because you have this big idea and there's a story you want to tell. So you have this idea about this French bulldog which speaks Spanish, who's best friends with this flower, is from another planet, and they find a time machine. Oh, I can't wait to tell the story. It's going to be great. So they're in the time machine, and the dog's speaking French, and the, uh, the flower's so happy, and then they meet this raccoon, and then something else happens, and then you kind of run out of steam. <laughs> My advice is after you get the big idea, before you kind of dig into the story, is think of an ending. Think of where the story is going to end. Even if it's not a great ending, because it means you will finish. If you finish your first story, duh, that's your sloppy copy, congratulations. Um, it means you can go fix it. If you finish it, it means you can work on it some more. Rather than have something that's half done, uh, when I was a kid, so many things that, that I started on with the big idea, I didn't finish it. And honestly, when you finish something, you absolutely, the first thing you want to do is not like, great, done. You kind of want to fix it and make it better. So think of a story. It doesn't have to be long. My books are 200 pages, but I'm 48 and been doing this for, you know, 40 years. Um, I think if you work on like a 30-page story or even a 10-page story and know where it's going to end, and then you can, then you just work on it till you just, till you just, oh, it's just falling apart and you don't even want to work on it any, anymore. Um, That'll make it great. So copying things is good. Think of an ending. Yes, you there in the fish shirt. Is there ever going to be a high-low movie or TV show? Maybe. I'll, I'll begin by plugging books because books are awesome. Um, right now they're books, and um, I love that they're books, and that's how I'm telling this story. It, we'll probably do something about it. Um, uh, I've worked in animation. I've I created, written, produced my own animated program, and I've written for animation. and. You know, and done stuff. Um, over the next, you know, over the next year, I'll probably be going and like pitching to people about movies or TV shows about Hilo, and we'll see. I'll say this: if uh, if Hilo became a movie um, and we started working on it tomorrow, it'd probably take about four years for us to finish. So it'll be a while. But I love doing it. I'd love to see it become something else. But it's a big old we'll see. So who knows? By next year, when I come back here, I might say, "Yep, we're doing a TV show," and you know, and, and we're off to the races. Um, I'm trying to get, hey, yes, you right here. What was the fat cat's name? What was the fat, oh, so the comic strip I did when I was little, the fat cat's name was Marvin. <laughs> he was Marvin, and he was a Russian blue. Not that I worked in color, um, <laughs> but I knew that he was a Russian blue. And I am working on a comic book. You're doing a comic right now? Mm -hmm. So you are basically doing what I did when I was a kid, so you're doing, you're doing funny drawings while half watching television. It's okay, it worked, out. it worked out for me just fine. <laughs> yes, in the back, in the yellow shirt and the glasses. Good and loud. These are big ears, but I listened to a lot of rock music when I was a kid. They barely work. Uh, where are high -low books sold? Where are Hilo books sold? That is an excellent question. Are you a plant? <laughs> Thank you, you're my favorite today. Um, Hilo is published through this small independent publisher called Random House. Um, <laughs> So the books are only available everywhere. Um, they're in bookstores, they're in comic book stores, they're available online. They, um, they, they, are, they are literally on sale, I believe, here, uh, here at the library, and they're also at, uh, um, I'm sorry, Vault of Midnight. Is that the comic store? Someone help me. I, ju I just signed there two hours ago, so you think I'd remember the name. Um, so I've already, they're, they're right there, and I already signed a bunch of them there. So um, just everywhere. Again, random house. It's okay. It's a nice place to be. Uh, yes, young lady, you there in the back, back row. Did you forget your question? I can always come back. Okay, I will come back to you. Uh, yes, you right there. Yes, in your Detroit baseball shirt. Yes. Are you asking me, is it okay to get an idea from video games? Yeah. Oh, it's okay to get an idea from anywhere. And, and also, I'm not saying you need to steal an idea. Um, because a lot of times, uh, stories are based on, well, it's based on like a mishmash of all things you love. Like Hilo. What's in Hilo? Hilo's got a lot of Doctor Who in there. It's got a lot of E.T. It's got a lot of Iron Giant. Um, these are the things I love. It's got a lot of Superman. Um, Superman, as we know, like he came from another planet and he fell from a sky. He, you know, he fell from the sky in a spaceship. Like you know, these things sound similar. And if you look at Hilo, he actually has the same kind of color scheme as uh, Superman. You know, reds, yellows, and blues. Um, 
Yes, and the H is inside the L. Right, it's there. I mean, if you look at them, everybody, it's a cartoon thing. It's also like a superhero thing that my guys, they, uh, they wear the same clothing all the time. Every book, day or night, they never change their clothes. Um, one, because it's a lot easier to do that, but two, it's just, it's just what you do in cartoons sometimes and, and superhero stuff. Like, that's kind of their uniform. Um, but it is, it is okay to get inspiration from anywhere. But I will say this, there, it's, it's okay to copy at first, but at some point, you're gonna find that you're gonna graduate to kind of telling your own stories in your own way. Like this, the, the, honestly, there's, there's chunks of uh, Hilo, which is inspired greatly by the TV show MASH. <laughs> Nobody's gonna see this but me. Nobody's gonna know the MASH stuff but me. And even if I pointed to like, yeah, that's totally like Hawkeye Pierce from MASH in this scene. If I spend 20 minutes explaining how it is, you'll never, like, I, I, still, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. But I do. And it's in there. Um, yes, young lady right there. How many rejections did you get throughout years that you've tried to publish your work? How many rejections did I get? Uh, my rejection layers. I used to, okay, I used to have a folder. Um, um, I'm, I'm looking at Jenny Robb while I say this because I, 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 I lost the folder. At some point, I threw it out. I know. <laughs> I'll get to why I'm pointing out Jenny in a second. Um, so I used to have this folder, which I labeled in case your head gets too big. And every time I'd get a rejection letter, um, I would put it in there. So after not too long, it was over like an inch and a half thick, and it became two folders. Um, so I had rejection letters. I, I had been sending my stuff out to syndicates, and I can feel Jenny just like, you don't have those letters. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, I've, I would send it out. Since I was like 16, 17 years old, I was sending out my work to cartoon syndicates who publish, um, who basically help you distribute um, comic strips in newspapers. And I had rejection letters from syndicates, I had rejection letters from uh, greeting card companies, t-shirt companies, later comp companies. And uh, what's fun about the rejection letters is you could sort of see the trajectory. First they start as a form letter, not signed by anybody. Then eventually you get a quasi form letter, which might mention the name of the thing that you sent in being rejected, and maybe it has an actual signature. And then you might actually get the rejection letter, which gives you a little bit of advice. Like sort of like, this is like, you know what? This is pretty good. It's not really suitable for our, for what we're doing right now, but you know what? I think I maybe concentrate a little more of this, a little concentrate on that. So I mean, yes. Hundreds, maybe you know, a couple of hundred rejection letters. Um, but I was very, very lucky. As I mentioned, my mom and dad were like the best. Um, so they gave me a very healthy ego uh, to go along with all those rejection letters. Um, so it takes a while. It took a while. I mentioned Jenny. Uh, Jenny, what's your official title at the? Uh, at curator. Your curator of the Billy Ireland. Uh, car is it Cartoon, li Cartoon Library Museum? Cartoon Library Museum. Yes, if you ever happen to be in Columbus, Ohio, you should go to the Billy Ireland Museum, which is the most amazing collection of comic strip and cartoon art kind of in the world. Um, and one of the things that uh, Jenny and her cohorts do is they collect everything to do with the history as well of, of uh, cartoons. Um, and a while back she said, do you have your rejection layers? Like, I think I just threw them all out. I think they're like, they're all gone. I'm like, good ones too. Like, here's one from Fantagraphics. Ooh, here's like the four I got from Lee Salem at Universal Press Syndicate. Name drop in there. Like, I mean it. I got one from Lee. Um, so those are kind of artifacts, old school, when they used to type out letters. Uh, I'm going to try and get some folks who have not asked a question yet. Uh, yes, do you remember your question, young lady? Yes. What do you got? Where did I come up with the names for the characters? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm checking the time. I think, is it? No, I've got time. I've got time. Um, um, sometimes the names just occur to me, like Gina. When I was coming up with Gina, she just felt like a Gina. Um, and other times it takes a little bit longer. I usually come up with the names of the characters not right away. Like, OK, I'm going to come up with a character named Gina. So what is Gina like? It goes the other way. I start writing the characters and working out the characters and what they look like and where they're from and who they are, and then name them. It's a little bit like when you get a pet. Like, you get, you get a dog, and you realize, like, I got a French bulldog who speaks Spanish. Um, and uh, I don't know what you are, but after a day or so, it's like, your name is Roscoe. Even though you're a girl dog, your name is Roscoe. <laughs> um, with me, it's sort of the same thing, that um, I started working on the book, and DJ was a character. I wanted a character with, initi with initials, because I like initials. And uh, I also like the idea of DJ having initials, because I felt at some point someone's going to call him by his full name. 
His name is DJ Lim, uh, but his full name is Daniel Jackson Lim. So I thought at some point, like, someone say, Daniel Jackson Lim, you come in here. That was, it was in my head. So, and he just felt like a DJ. Hilo's name took so long, comparatively. Um, I was writing the book for a couple of months, and I really didn't know what to call him yet. So I did what I usually do, which is a placeholder name. So for a little while, I was calling him Sky, because he falls out of the sky. And then after a while, I didn't want to call him Sky, because Sky, sky is kind of a real name. And that wasn't going to be his name, so I wanted it to do something that wasn't going to be a name at all. So I literally was calling him High, because he came up from high in the sky. So I'd be working on these scenes in my head while I'm driving around, when I'm exercising. So DJ and Hi are out here doing this, and Gina and Hi and Gina are doing this and that. Um, and then one, at one day, I'm driving in my car, I'm thinking about the scene between DJ and this character who's not gonna be called Hi. And DJ makes a play on words where he says, yeah, you came up from way on high and then you were brought down low. <laughs> what was that? And it just kind of clicked. It was the first time I put the two words together, high and low. And I was in the car and I said it out loud like, hi, low. Oh, I kind of like the sound of that. I kind of like the sound of that a lot. Um, and then I like sat with it for a couple of days like, oh, you are a French bulldog named, named Roscoe. So his name was hi, low. It just felt right. I liked it because it was a made up name and it felt like something that was kind of personal to him. Um, I found out much later that there's actually a city in Hawaii named Hilo, same spelling. Um, I found that out from, we were, we were doing like an author video and the guy was directing it and said, so is it pronounced Hilo or Hilo? You know, like the city in Hawaii. Like, there's a city in Hawaii named Hilo? It's like, yeah, it's like, oh, okay. No, Hilo, high and low. And I probably should check into this city. Though many of us are like at Random House are petitioning that we should go do a Hilo signing in Hilo. You know, and a bunch of us get to go to Hawaii. Because the book could use that. We should do that. Yes, young lady right here. Ever, 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 or for this book? In this book. Um, probably DJ. DJ was probably the first character I came up for the Hilo series. I had this idea that there was going to be uh, a normal little boy who was a little bit lonely, and then he was going to meet an amazing friend. A little bit like Doctor Who. The Doctor Who fans can sort of see it out there. Um, so DJ was first, because he was a little bit like me. Yes, Joaquin, what is your question? The first character I came up ever, it might have been Marvin that cat way back when, that, fat, that first rip-off of Garfield I did. Um, and don't forget, the ripping off of other comic strips went on for a very, very long time. Um, when uh, I actually went to the University of Michigan uh, School of Art, and I did a comic strip for the Michigan Daily called Nuts and Bolts. And for the first year or so, I'd say that Nuts and Bolts bear a not too unfamiliar comparison to Bloom County, um, like a lot, um, until I sort of like figured out what kind, you know, what kind of comic strip it should be. Like when I actually made it kind of personal uh, uh, is when it, it stopped being about Bloom County and stopped, started kind of being nuts and bolts. I mean that the least airy-fairy way, but um, a lot of times you learn how to do stuff just by doing it. You just gotta get in there. Uh, yes, you here. Two things, yes. The two questions are, what are the rules of making comics and what is my most favorite character that I ever made? The rules of making comics is there are no real rules, except um, I, th I think they absolutely have to have drawings. That's it. If someone hands you like, you know, you know, a piece of wood and say, this is a comic, you can say, no, that's a piece of wood. But if they drew on it, then it could be a comic. It doesn't even need words. Um, I think all cartoons and comics, I think at the very, very least, um, they, they have to have drawings. But I will say, um, I, I love cartoons that sort of have a beginning, middle, and end. Even if it's a one-panel cartoon, that's a joke. And you're supposed to have it. It should have, it should have a thought, a moment, something about it that has some sort of sense of, you know, that we're, we've begun and, we've, and we're done. Because um, they're like little stories. Um, if it's just a picture, then it's just a picture. Um, and that's not necessarily, you know, a story. It's, 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 it's a drawing. Um, yes, you back there. Uh, yeah, okay, so how do most cartoonists get their ideas for a story? How do most cartoonists get their ideas for stories? 
Um, I can only tell you what I do, which, and I mean, other cartoonists I know, they steal their ideas from TVs and movies. And uh, the, I thought I'd get a bigger laugh out of that. I was kidding. <laughs> was totally, totally kidding. Um, I think, I, you know what? I was just talking to somebody today. Um, and uh, she just graduated from the University of Michigan, and she wants to do comic books. And uh, she has a couple of ideas. Uh, and one we were talking about, like, you know, what's, what's oddly what's really popular right now is that we're finally doing more all-ages comics. Um, and you don't have to necessarily do a story about Superman or, or Spider-Man to, like, do a comic book story. Like, mainstream publishers are interested now. That's great. And she said, well, the one I had in mind that I really, really love is more of a, like, kind of adult thing. And she described it and was like, yeah, but that's sort of a grown-up story. I said, but do you love it? It's like, yeah, tell that one. Tell the story you love best because you're definitely going to finish it. You're definitely going to want to work on it. Don't tell a story that you think people are interested in. Don't tell a story that you think someday that someone might want to like, pay money for or something like that. Tell the one that you love. Um, I will say this, that I've done both these things. I've done jobs which have just been for money, um, and I've done jobs which I didn't know if they were going to work out at all. Case in point, Hilo. Hilo came, you know what, I can just tell this. No one's asked yet, but, so, in case anyone asks me how I came up with Hilo, which nobody has yet, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, this kind of works our way in. So, um, I've done lots of stuff as a cartoonist. Um, lots of stuff. Uh, I've done comic strips. It's a comic strip I did for about four years. It's called Frumpy the Clown. Um, I did an animated series that I created. Um, it was called Life of Times of Juniper Lee. It was on Cartoon Network for about three and a half seasons. Um, I wrote superhero comics for both Marvel and DC and Dark Horse and others. I did this X-Men comic called Exiles. I wrote Green Arrow. I wrote Green Lantern. Uh, I wrote this guy you might have heard of called Batman. Um, so I've been very, very lucky that I've done all kinds of different cartoons. Now I tell you that, I tell you this. So five years ago, my son, that's my son, he came to me and asked me, he said, Dad, and I said, yeah. He said, Dad, can, can I read some of your superhero comics? Like, Batman, can I please read your Batman comics? And I tell him, my Batman comics? Oh, no, no, no. You can't read my Batman comics. My Batman comics, you're seven. And they're a little kind of intense for someone seven years old. So he and I started looking around for a series that we thought would be really good for him. And the one that we landed on that we really, really loved was Bone. Bone was the one we landed on. And he loved Bone. And just went crazy go nuts for it. We read all nine graphic novels, rifled through it, loved it. Now, I'm very lucky. I happen to know Jeff Smith, the cartoonist who does Bone. And I called Jeff up and said, Jeff, my son just went crazy go nuts bananas for Bone. And Jeff said, that is awesome. Tell you what. I'm going to send you guys something in the mail. Sit tight. Jeff then mailed us two gigantic boxes of bone stuff. I noticed. Merchandise. It, in there, there were action figures and stuffed animals and calendars and hats and posters and T-shirts. And my son became a bone super fan. <laughs> he lost his mind. And me, I got jealous. <laughs> Because I figured, man, I'm a cartoonist. I should be able to make something that he likes as much as he likes bone. So I sat down at the drawing board, literally, um, and tried to figure out what that would be. Now, as I talked about a little bit here, is that I, uh, I did comic strips. And that's the kind of cartoonist I am. I draw kind of cartoony like a comic strip. And I like lots of jokes, like you see in a comic strip. But... I've also written superhero comics, a lot of them. And I know how to tell those stories. I knew that was the kind of story my son wanted. Kind of like Bone, kind of like Batman, this ongoing sort of sequential story that would move forward. So I took these two ideas, I put them in a blender, not actual blender, but my head, and out came Hilo. And Hilo is really like a combination of all those things. It looks like a comic strip, it's got lots of jokes like a comic strip, but it's very much like an action adventure superhero story. Um, every book, as like a lot of you folks probably know, is, is one chapter in Hilo's life, and the story moves forward. The first book leads to the second book, leads to the third one, leads to the fourth one, and onward. Um, and that is where Hilo kind of came from. And I say all this to say this, that I kind of feel like everything I've done from like comic strips to superhero comics to animation has sort of led to me figuring out 
this. I think this is the story I've always kind of wanted to do. This is the way I wanted to do it. This is how I wanted to do it. These are the characters I wanted to do. I think I've always wanted to really tell this all ages action adventure with lots of jokes. I think this is, this is where I was supposed to do it. I, uh, without getting choked up or getting too maudlin about it, I figured out just before I was doing Hilo that, that I spent about five years why I didn't draw, that uh, I was writing superhero comics, I was developing live action TV, and uh, it was occurring to me that I was incredibly unhappy. And a lot of that, I think, had to do with the fact because I forgot who I was, and being a cartoonist isn't my job, it's my vocation, it's really, really who I am. And um, I sat down and did, I did the first Hilo book just on spec, meaning I didn't know where it was gonna go or what we were gonna do with it. 200 page graphic novel that I drew in pencil and lettered, done. I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. I didn't know what I was gonna do as a Kickstarter or just publish it myself or it was gonna be a publisher, but I, need, no, I, I knew I needed to do this for me. And luckily the small independent publisher, Random House, thought it was pretty good. Um, and so, you know, I lucked into that. But going into it, it was, it was a year and a half in change of work where I wasn't getting paid for it. Um, I had other jobs, but when what little time I had, I was gonna do this. And I knew from when, not too long, a couple of weeks into it, like, I love this, this is what I wanna do. Holy mackerel, I hope, it pay, I hope, I hope this works, I get to do this. Um, I will also say that uh, my wife is terrific and, uh, and very, very supportive. And at one point, I was, I was hoping for that magical overlap and sometimes you get it like, yep, I want to land another job before I quit my old job, which is always a nice theory. <laughs> um, but I think most of the grown-ups know they're like, yeah, sometimes you got to jump and hope the net will be there. Um, so there was a little while when I said like, yeah, I think I want to stop doing all this stuff and just keep working on high level. She said, you just keep working on high level. I'm like, are you sure? Yes. Anytime you've ever loved anything, it's always worked out. So this worked out probably because I just, I just love it so much. Yes, Jingle, you there back. Does your son like Hilo? Does my son like Hilo? I, I practically want to joke, because so I'm like, he thinks it's okay. I want to joke, but I can't even bring myself to joke about it. Um, yes, when I finished doing that 200 page book on spec, and I didn't know where it was going to go, um, so I draw on 11 by 17 paper and pencil, and I photocopied it, and so I gave him these 200 pages of photocopy, um, and I said, you know, so buddy, could, could, you know, so he's about eight and change uh, at this point. I said, hey, so I did this book, and I really would like you to read it. And he looks at it and goes, okay, can I read it when it's done? <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted it to look like a book book and color and lettered properly. He's like, yeah, maybe, but daddy really kind of wants you to read it now, if that's okay. Oh, okay. So he took this binder and went up to his room, and I'm standing at the bottom of the stairs listening. And he starts reading it, I can hear him in there, and it's really quiet. Then I hear that he's laughing, and he's laughing some more. Then he comes downstairs about two hours later, because he read the whole thing in one sitting, which is the biggest compliment. And he came back all excited. He says, what do you think? He says, I think it's great. I really, really liked that. That was really, really great. Can I read the next one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's about another year, but thank you. So um, there are no bigger fans of Hilo than, I mean, as you know from this talk, from my son and my daughter, who are both, you know, invested in it. And they get to read it before anyone else. They get to weigh in. Uh, my daughter, who, as I explained, you know, was pitching me putting a cat in the book um, for a long time, and a cat wound up being in a book. Uh, so she has, she is all full of ideas now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, many of them work their way in the book a little bit. I, I, I have explained to her many, many times, like, I don't think you're going to land the plane as well as you did with Polly. That's, like, that's not going to happen. I mean, she wants a spin-off book where Polly's out on her own, doing her own adventures, and, and that one too. But um, they are my first readers. The first people who read the book are my wife and my kids. And I'm very, very lucky that you know, I'm doing this all-ages book that is for grown-ups and for children, and my, my kids are nine and 13. My son's 13 now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, when I was doing superhero comics, you know, they, they couldn't really wrap their heads around, I mean, they couldn't read that stuff. But now I'm doing stuff that's exactly in their age group that they're supposed to read and enjoy. And I have to tell all you grown-ups, if you get to do something like this that your kids actually love and appreciate and are proud of the work you do, the word I use is, it took me a while to get around, like, yeah, they really like that you do it, cause they're, and they, they tell their friends, and like, because they're, Proud? Like, you know, it's like, that's awesome. It's better than drugs. I highly recommend it. <laughs>
And uh, I think I got time for two or three more questions. Yes, you right here. You. Do you think you'll ever make a merchandise book? Do, for do, uh, uh, when, when you, the question was, do you think I'll ever make a merchandise book for Iowa? What do you mean? What does he mean? Oh, do you think, do you, oh, the question is, do I ever think we'll do high-low merchandise? It's like, yeah, everybody likes money. Um, <laughs> so I'll say this, like, yeah, they'll, at some point, I mean, I, I, I have to be honest, just a little, little just math and calendar talk. High-low only came out, I mean, I'm very, very lucky, and I also happen to work quickly. The first book came out in 2015, um, so it hasn't even been three years. Uh, so I, I've been, A, very, very fortunate how successful the series is, uh, and um, at some point, then not to, you know, we'll make, you know, we actually did high-low t-shirts and nobody bought them. My, favorite, my friend Nate did them. I was terrible promoting them, so we're going to do, like, another round of it. Because, you know, I know, who would like a high-low t-shirt? Like, Claudia. Um, so, don't worry. Uh, if you, it's funny when uh, people come over our house uh, and there are toys everywhere. They will say, like, wow, your kids like toys a lot. Like, <laughs> yeah. And that's not the kids' toys. That's all, that's all my stuff. Like, really? Like, yes, the, the entire bookshelf full of Funkos, those are mine. Um, so I like merchandise. I like toys. So we'll definitely do high-low stuff for sure. Yes, you. Um, well, Jess Smith made a bow with, like, a, a big bow series. Where it has all the books in one book. Did you do that Oh, Jeff Smith. The question was, Jeff Smith did a massive collection, the Bone Tome which has like all nine graphic novels in one thing. It's like, it's, it's literally this big. Um, we're not gonna do that because um, ugh, it would just be so big. Like Jeff only did a limited run of those because it's just so, so big. Um, but we are, we are doing, um, we're doing a high-low box set, which will be coming out in October. So the first three books will be available in one, you know the box sets, the cardboard box sets. Uh, so the first three will be in a box set. And I think they'll keep doing box sets. Um, at some point, I might do a larger format version of it. Um, Hilo is, uh, is published in France, and they do it hardcover in like magazine size. They do it like 9 by 12. And um, they actually had to break the books up. So the first book is in two parts in this amazing large you know, hardcover format, uh, but it's in French. Um, my daughter was the funniest. She's just, this is so cool. It'd be so much better if it wasn't in French. <laughs> It's like, yeah, like you're missing a step, but yes, yes. Um, but I think everyone at Random House sort of liked the idea of like doing a larger format one. So we might do something like that. Um, I think I have time for one or two more questions real quick. Yes, in there in the back. How, I, how do I come up with my character designs? That is an excellent question. Um, for Hilo was the first time that I sat down and thought about it because I wanted this to be, uh, I knew I was gonna draw these characters for years. So I did the thing that, um, well, do you guys ever pick up when an animated movie comes out, uh, let's say like Coco, you all should go check out like these big books that come out after every animated feature, The Art Of, so The Art Of Coco. If you thumb through it, you'll see particularly what's fun is the character design stuff where a bunch of people will draw, Miguel's the lead character in Coco, right? Yeah. Okay, so there'll be all different versions of Miguel. So here's Miguel if he was short and squatty. Here he is a little bit older, like almost like a mustache. And here he is like skinnier and this, like different versions of it. For me, I actually did that for Hilo. When I was thinking about the characters, I knew kind of who they'd be and the story was working. I took a sketchbook and I kept drawing the characters over and over and over again. Just pages and pages of Hilo with different haircuts. And Hilo originally looked more like DJ and like with like, like straight up hair. And, like, and I kept drawing them till A, I was sort of happy with them. And also B, knowing that I was going to draw these characters over and over again for years. Um, there's a, a, a cartoonist who uh, does comic books. His name is Walt Simonson. Walt Simonson um, uh, tells this great story about character design. He was, uh, incredibly long story short, he was creating this character called Beta Ray Thor. And the idea between this character is that he is a character who fights Thor. We all know Thor because in the movies. He steals Thor's hammer. Um, but back then, Thor's hammer, when Thor would become a human being, his, his hammer would turn into just a cane. So this alien, whose name, who's named Beta Ray Bill, stole the, stole the cane and then accidentally activates it and turns into a hammer. And then he became Beta Ray Thor. So he turned into a version of Thor. And Walt drew this amazing, beautiful costume. 
like huge helmet, like epaulets all over it, this amazing cape with all this design over it. It was beautiful. And the way Walt tells the story is like he was so happy with it because it was just gorgeous. And then he got to the second issue and realized he had to draw it again. <laughs> and he's like, what did I do? Of oh, the boots alone take forever. Um, so part of his thinking about that is like, I wanted to come up with a character design that was like kind of simple, easy to do, and I was sort of in love with it. So character design for me is about repetition. You know, it was about doing these characters over and over again to find one that, that, that felt right. So keep drawing them until you're like, like, that's it. That feels right. Okay, one last question. Alexander, are you stretching or you have a question? Still you, Alexander. He didn't have a question, he was stretching. Okay. Uh, yes, you right there, young man. Yes, you. Why do they have four fingers? Ah, I love this question so much. We're going to end on this one. Okay. This is a really nerdy cartoon question. Thank you for asking it. Okay. If you notice, um, the high-low characters only have four fingers. And um, this is because, um, so when they first started doing animation over 100 years ago, the animators quickly figured out that when the characters had five fingers, they kept making mistakes. The animation kept getting screwed up. They would do the fingers wrong, they were getting too hard to animate. So somebody, at some point, started doing like, it's easier if we just do four fingers. Their hands are smaller, less fingers, and they started doing them all with four fingers. Look at Mickey Mouse, look at Bugs Bunny, look at all your older cartoons, they all have four fingers, rather, you know, four fingers on each hand. So before Hilo, I'd always draw characters with five fingers, with 10 fingers. But for Hilo, I don't know, I kind of wanted to do a little bit of classic animation thing going on. So I decided to do them with four fingers. And it's not a problem, it's just something I did with a, just a nod to old school animation. And again, it's, it doesn't come up, it's not weird unless someone says something like, you know, I told him 10 times to do that. I just don't do that. <laughs> um, so it is a little nod to um, old school animation. It's super noticeable. And on a picture like this, especially like when DJ's hands like, like splayed out like that, it looks so weird. Um, but in the context of the book, I just read it, you don't really notice it. Um, yeah. So uh, that's why. It's just a little nod to the older cartoons. Okay, you are my very last question. The pressure's on you. It's got to be so good. I know it will be. Tell me. Did you forget your question? <laughs> so the, the question slash suggestion over here is like, I could add a dragon to the story. So tell you what, come visit me every morning at my studio and say, Judd, you know, I think the next Hilo book would be really good if you put a dragon in it. And it might work out. You never know. It's worked out before. So come find me every morning. You and I will talk about it. Dragons. It may be the next book. I will tell you this. In the next story arc, there's definitely going to be dragons. For sure. Absolutely. Unless I change my mind, and then there won't be. <laughs> okay, so with that, thank you guys so much. You've been awesome. Thank you. This program was recorded on June 16th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.